Okay, first of all, thank you for letting us talk tonight. We get quite a kick out of what we have here on some of the Lost Roads Mind stuff. Now, Louise has in her hand the book that really got me started in this. It's no longer in press, in print, and when she bought it for me, it was from a resident of Camas, and it was a prized book. Since then, the price of it has skyrocketed and dropped. But it is really a fun book to read. Also, there's another series of books here that we have read. Uh, I have read probably 40, maybe only 35 books on the Lost Roads Mine and the mining in this area. They're all good. If anybody is looking for a book of this area, this one right here comes from the Forest Service. And it's a kind of a tour guide from Canvas to Evanston. It is one that I would really recommend you pick up. We'll refer to a couple of these other books as we go through. Now, we'll get started here. Uh, which of us has heard about the gold at the end of the rainbow? Okay, everybody has. And then we've heard, there's gold in them thar hills from the days of the 49ers. Well, is there gold in them thar hills? I don't know. We'll find out. Now, who knows the difference between history, a myth, folklore, or, well, I don't know, just about anything like that. What about a legend? Who knows what the differences are? Have we got some guesses? Who can tell us what history is? Things that actually happened. Things that actually happened. Okay. That's history. What's How it? do we know if it happened? <laughs> yeah, I think you can right now. Document it. Okay, it could be documented. But let me point out something about documented history in Utah. I did a lot of traveling on my job, and one of the guys that I travel a lot with asked me one day, he says, you're always reading books on Utah. I said, yeah, I read a lot of them. He says, well, what do you think of them? I said, I like Utah history, but I don't like to read Utah history that is written first by a female and about her family. because. Women don't think their family does anything wrong. So you got to be careful on documented history. But you're right, if it's written down, and in today's world, we've got recorders and VCRs, documented history is good. Okay, what about a legend? Who knows what a legend is? Passed down from generation to generation. Yeah, it might have some basis in fact, but it might have been embellished or, you know, changed. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. And then we talk of a myth. Okay, a myth. They're the stories about the stars, you know, and the way they are. So we have to be a little bit careful on just what, what we take as true hard facts. Now, tonight we're going to talk about a family called Rhodes. Okay. Got four spellings of it right here. And it's not unusual at all to see something like that. Especially when you talk of Utah history. First of all, the pioneers that came and settled the Utah area were basically a very poor financial group of people without a lot of education. Spelling was not important to them. The writing of uh, things that happened was very important, but you have to be very careful when you're reading it. So that's the reason that we could get four different spellings of the same word without any trouble. Now, there's gold mines. They're storied to be somewhere in the U in the mountains here. Stories, history possibly. They tell us that they're south and a little bit east of where we are right now. So, I said mines, M-I-N-E-S, plural, because there's supposed to be several of them. 
and the name of them are Rhodes. R-O-H-A, whatever you want here. Now, Rhodes is a very important person for people like Louise and I who live in the Camas Valley. The reason being is when Camas was developed by Thomas Rhodes, first it was Fort Rhodes, then Rhodes Ford, Rhodes, uh, Rhodes Valley, Camas Valley, and then Camas. So it has all worked its way down there to uh, what we have today. And I go to the older people than I am, if possible, in the Camas area, and I talk to them and I say, where was Fort Rhodes? Because I want to find out. There's two real distinct possibilities, possibly more. One is north of town, there's an old branch. It was the S Bar S that some of you may know of. It's where they raised a lot of horses. One school of thought says that's where the fort was made. It was first built. The second school of thought is just west of Main Street in Camas. There is a replica building of what they call the original house in Camas. That was, is the second thought. Okay, now when they talk of the fort roads, it was about 16 rods square or about 500 feet square, and the houses were on the outside, and they could keep the people in the fort, they'd put the cattle out during the day, and they would bring them back in at night. Now, wherever this was, I have the written history, handwritten from one of the old timers from Camas, it's in my collection. He's no longer alive, and he tells of in the days when he was a young man, that uh, he remembers the walking around the catwalk at night, and they would holler to each other, it's 8 o'clock and I'm on the north wall, everything's A-OK. -okay. So the fort is a very, very interesting thing that we have in the area for us, the, the stories about it. Now I call it Fort Roads. Louise has got something that she picked up in the antique business that she'll show you about Fort Rhodes. Does anybody know what a sampler is? In, oh, early on, even the 1700s, but Victorian era, all the women were to be well schooled in needlework. This was what they did, was their needlework and their art and played music. That was what they did for their schooling. This sampler was made in 1866. It's dated and it says Soyez Gentil. We are assuming the girl's name was Soyez and she was a Gentile. No? Soyez Gentil means be nice. Okay, okay. But we thought she was a Gentile in the Mormon you know, not a Mormon because of that on here. Now, excuse me, what was your yeah. comment there? My comment is that the the Soyez Gentil, the, what she's written there, means and, be nice. And what French. language is that? It's in French. French. In French. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we assume she was an immigrant, which she would be oh, an immigrant. <laughs> but I had an antique dealer who dealt in samplers tell me that he thought it meant she was not LDS and didn't know how to spell Gentile. So, yeah, who knows? Anyway, and she has Rhodes Fort on here. R-H-O-D-E-S, another spelling of it. Not the A in it. So, anyway, this is what the young women did. This was their education, to do needlework, to learn music. And this has been documented. It's the correct yarn, the correct fabric for the date. So this is very interesting. There is really very little history of Rhodes Ford or anything that survived from it. So this was, and that's interesting, French, because yeah, the guy that documented it for me thought it was probably some Scandinavian. It just means be nice or be kind. Okay, yeah. in French. That's interesting. No, that, that's wonderful to and hear that. And so you know what else? Possibly she was studying French. Maybe she was studying it. Maybe she was French descended. Because I would haven't heard of a lot of French immigrants yeah. during that era. There were lots of Scandinavians, and so maybe she was studying French in her education. 
but very interesting. Thank you for that. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about gold. Now, gold is not new in the Uinta Mountains. Uh, 500 years ago, the, there were Spanish explorer in this area looking for gold. And in Duchesne over here, not too far from where we are, in the town park, there is a monument there, and it is signifying and uh, giving blessing to Father Escalante, who was there 350 years ago looking for gold up that way. Now, uh, in the town of Francis, down in the valley, there is a corner store. It's now Joe's Corner Store. It's had three or four names to it. But several years ago, the guy who owned and operated that corner store, he and one of his good buddies spent almost every minute they could scrounge together, and they were out looking for any kind of tracks or traces of the Spanish explorers that were in the area looking for gold. And lo and behold, they found a part of a metallic Spanish style helmet, a leather breastplate, and they found a mortar pestle that still had gold in it. So this is stuff that they found here near the Uwinda Mountains. So who were they? <laughs> who? Yeah. It was I can see his name was Chad. Chad something, and they operated the corner okay. store. It was probably 10 years ago when he sold it. But they, he was really successful. And as soon as his wife got the short store, he was gone <laughs> in the summer. So he did a lot of good things. Now, we've talked of gold and we talked of the roads. Well, local stories of Thomas Rhodes and gold in this area go hand in hand. Now, how did he get here? Thomas Rhodes was a convert to the Mormon Church. Uh, I better stop right there, because I'm going to say something. First of all, I'm going to talk of Mormons, and I'm going to talk of LDS. They're the same to me. I don't know which is which. Also, I may refer to Indians or Native Americans. I'm not trying to put one or the other down or elevate one or the other. I use them the same. So, Thomas Rhodes joined the Mormon Church. He joined it in Nauvoo when uh, Brigham Young was getting ready to start his treks west. Well, Thomas Rhodes was an impatient type of a person, and he went to Brigham Young and talked him into letting him start west with a group of Mormons prior to the initial group of Mormons moving west. Well, Brigham reluctantly let him do this, and Rhodes started west with a group of Mormons, and they ran into another wagon train. Well, this other wagon train had had all kinds of trouble with leadership. Not with getting places, but with who was going to take charge of what was going on. So they approached Thomas Rhodes, who was quite a leader in himself, and he took over the leadership of both trains. And they made very good progress west, but like all of the wagon trains, they had some dissension, and they re-separated. And the part that went away from Thomas Rhodes, they continued on, and they got a very late start through the Nevada desert. And they ended up, being one of the most infamous wagon trains to ever leave and go west. It's the Donner Party. A lot of them didn't make it, but had they stayed with Thomas Rhodes, they would have been much better off. Rhodes took his group and he made a different path and he made it all the way to California. And in California, he started working for guy named John Augustus Sutter. Well, now here we get legends and stories and all kinds of things because uh, Thomas Rhodes and his family, they did a little bit of exploring alongside just freelance work and they claimed that they found gold. 
and that they went to talk to Sutter and made an arrangement with him that they could keep a portion of it. Well, now, history, I can go back in my family. And when I was at grade school, the same story was told me about my great-great-grandpa, James Stevens Brown. He had the same arrangement, so maybe uh, Rhodes was just shrewder than my family was. But they did, uh, Thomas Rhodes did find gold there and learned a little bit about it. But Brigham Young sent a letter to Thomas Rhodes, and he says, yeah, we have made it to Salt Lake. We're not going to continue on to California like you would like us to. But please come back to Salt Lake, because we need you there. Now we can get the stories about Thomas Rhodes and Gold get there, really get going. Uh, I worked in a, as a construction engineer on a gold plant out in Nevada. And I have a picture someplace at home of me holding a nugget of gold about that big around and about that thick. It weighed around 20 pounds. And I checked it this morning with local prices, current prices, that'd be worth about $700,000 today. Wasn't worth near that when I was out there. But they said that he brought a wagon, a barrel full of gold to Utah from California. Okay, a barrel, we see them on the wagons, on the side of the wagon quite often in the pictures. So I started estimating, I said, well, we could put three of those buttons of gold in a wagon, the barrel, and we could stack them about 40 high, and that would be a ton of gold, right near 2,000 pounds of gold. Now, the old wagons, putting a ton on one side, would have a tendency to flip over in a big hurry. So that story gets a little bit hard to believe. But Thomas Rhodes did get to Salt Lake with some gold. Uh, it looks like, from the most of the books that I've read, it was in the neighborhood of $17,000 worth of gold. And being a good Mormon, he gave the money, the gold, to Brigham Young. Now, the Mormons were having a heck of a time getting going with their new village, their new city, their new development. And Brigham Young had converted one of the local Indian chiefs to become a Christian and a, a Mormon. Now this was, uh, excuse me, Chief Wakara. Now the natives called him Wakara, the uh, white people called him Walker. The good chief had become a Christian and a a good Mormon. But not all of his buddies were good Mormons. And have Louise read you a quote out of this book about what kind of uh, life the Indians or the Native Americans had. Now this is after what died. This is about Chief Walker's death. On January 29, 1855, Chief Walker died at Meadow Creek in Millard County and in accordance with the old Indian custom, was buried in a large cliff of rocks. His tomb having been walled in and with all the honor bestowed upon an Indian of his rank. Two squaws, two Paid Indian slaves, and 15 of his horses were killed and buried with him, with his remains. His most cherished possession was a handwritten letter from Brigham Young, received the very day of his death <clears throat> and it was buried with him at his request. Also buried with Walker, and we never know if we should read this or not. <laughs> it's really hard for me to read this, and you're going to see. Also buried with Walker were two of his children, a small boy and girl, and they were entombed alive with him so they could, as the Indians believed, scare away any evil spirits that might try to enter Walker's grave. Uh, they were also to give him companionship on his long journey to the happy hunting grounds. 
Okay, before he died, Chief Walker had become a very good friend of Brigham Young. Uh, he thought that anything Brigham did was absolutely great. And he could see that the Mormons were having all kinds of trouble. They didn't have the money to do this. They didn't, couldn't do this. They, they just didn't have the finances to back him. Well, he went to Brigham Young, and he made the statement that the Indians did have some money rock that they could give to the Indians, or give to the Mormons, but they had to have some pretty strict rules on what these uh, regulations were going to be to get the money. Let Louise tell you a little bit more about hey, that. Chief Walker set down three specific conditions that were to be strictly adhered to before Thomas Rhodes could enter the mountains for the purpose of attaining, obtaining the precious gold. They were, number one, the location of the gold would be re revealed only to one man, mutually trusted by Brigham Young and the Ute Indians. This man would be kept under constant surveillance at all times while in the area, and Brigham Young, Young himself, for purposes of assurance, would not know the location of the gold. Number two, the penalty of death would automatically be incurred upon the man chosen to retrieve the gold if he gave the secret of its location to any man or attempted to bring out the gold without the permission of the youths, expressly Walker or the head chiefs though he could bring out as much of the precious metal as he could pack for the use of the church. Any white man who attempted to follow the chosen man to the gold's location would also suffer the death penalty. Walker expressed the fact that the Indians would not at any time assist in the mining of the gold, since no large-scale operation was necessary anyway, and they needed only a little for their own use. Besides, the Utes were hunters, not miners, and they were still seething from the forced labor pushed upon them only years earlier by the Spaniards. Okay, Brigham Young, he had one rule for Chief Wakero, Chief Walker. This is that Walker should take an oath upon the Book of Mormon to ensure that he would not break his word and was not speaking with a forked tongue. This Walker readily agreed to do but only if Brigham Young and the man entrusted with the gold would make the covenant also, and in his presence, all of which was agreed upon. Okay, so now, Chief Walker and Brigham Young have got this decided upon. Well, they met with <coughs> Thomas Rhodes, the man selected by Brigham Young. Chief Walker had this warm, fuzzy feeling about uh, Thomas Rhodes, and he agreed that it would be a good man to go. So he was able to go out and get some money rock. On his first trip into the Uinta Mountains, he went with an Indian guide to the mine. And they returned, so the story says, with 62 pounds of gold. It doesn't say whether it was gold, gold ore, or if it was gold ore, what percent it was. But it does say that there was 62 pounds. Okay, when Thomas Rhodes made his additional trips at Brigham Young's request, they would traditionally last somewhere between 10 days and 2 weeks. Okay, now i got to remember that these guys were a pretty tough bunch of people. So I went to the, my buddies in Camas here and I says, Okay, how far can you guys ride your horse and lead a couple of other pack animals in a day. And I think that the, pretty much the general feeling is that they could ride from Camas to Bear Lake, Bald Mountain area, in a day with a horse and a couple of pack animals. But they also told me, don't ask them to do it two days in a row. They're behind to be just a little bit tender after that much time. So I know the men, 100 years ago, were tougher than we are now. So I'll say that, well, maybe they could ride up here to camp, to Bald Mountain area from the Rhodes Valley. Don't know for sure just where it was. It was up this way or possibly out toward Hannah or Duchesne out in that area. 
Now, Thomas Rhodes was able to get gold back to the Mormons as, as they stated. Stories tell us that. Now, what did they use to find the gold for? I looked it up again today to make sure I've got my dates about correct. But they made Mormon money. Uh, in the, on the internet, there is a guy who claims to have found five pieces of Mormon money in his family collection. This happened in the last three or four years. He had it appraised, and the comment made to him was, if it is not fake, we have an expert on fakes here tonight, but if it is not fake, these coins would be worth about $100,000 a piece. They would have been made in 1849. Okay, another use for the gold is for the angel Moroni on top of the Mormon temple in Salt Lake. Now here I have a little bit of question because it was 1850, 1860 when they were up here getting the gold. The Mormon temple was not completed until 40 years after that. So, I don't know. Maybe it was gold, maybe it was from here, maybe some other place. But there's a couple of stories that are very prevalent about the angel Moroni on the temple. First of all, when it was put up there, people said nobody could put gold outside like that. It's just got to be a gold paint up there. Well, that's false because it is gold plating. And... Uh, my old, youngest son is a very active LDS gentleman, and he has been told that the angel Moroni, Moroni that is sitting on the temple today is not the original one. He said that because in the older days when they plated something, that thin layer of gold, the older days they put so much gold on it that it was just not economically possible to leave that that much money sitting up there so it has been replaced with a thinner layer of gold I don't say it is I don't say it's not but that is a couple of stories that we've heard about this so that is where some of the gold is supposed to have gone okay now after Thomas Rhodes had been retrieving this gold for a couple of years he got really really sick it was expected that he was going to die. It's just that simple. And so they, uh, Brigham Young went to Chief Arapee, who was, had taken over as chief of the tribe of Indians here. And he was Chief Wakara's brother. And he went to Arapee and he says, look, we still need the money rock. And so Arapee got with him and they looked around and they selected... Caleb Rhodes, who was the son of Thomas Rhodes, to be the next man to uh, be able to go into the mountains and get gold. He had to have the very same conditions put on him that uh, Thomas had. So he did that and agreed to everything like Thomas had, and he retrieved gold from the uh, Indian mines until Thomas did eventually get better. And then both the father and the son were making the trips into the mountains to get the gold. Now, where is it? Where were they going? I don't know. But, <coughs> excuse me. There are a lot of stories about where the gold was and what things that happened up there. Now, one time, when Thomas Rhodes, before Caleb joined him, uh, he had a bunch of cattle stolen from him by the Indians in the Rhodes Valley. And they took off and they headed up toward Hannah or Duchesne. So Thomas Rhodes went out and he got a bunch of the people from the Rhodes Valley. And they spent several days. They caught up with the Indian tribe. They retrieved their cattle and started bringing them back to the Rhodes Valley. Well, you know, you, with cattle, it takes a little longer than riding on a horse, but they were coming back, and they had to stop, 
and give the cattle a break. And Thomas says, hey, hold it here for a while, guys. He left them and was gone for about four to six hours, depending upon who you believe in the author. And when he came back, he paid the people who would help him retrieve his cattle in gold from the Lost Roads Mines. So he, he was able to get that. Another time when he was out on an expedition, the guys with him started hassling him and teasing him, saying, there's no such thing up here. There's no signs of mining. There's nothing around up here that could let us believe there's a mine. So Thomas took the day off with his troops. And he said, you guys go out and look and find whatever you want. You know, look it all over. I'll sit here and wait for you. So they did. They went out looking. They spent all day. They didn't find anything. So they go back to the Rhodes Valley. And a few days later, they're giving him a bad time again. And he says, I don't know what you're looking for. I could see the mine the whole time you were out there looking. It was right there, right in front of you. Mm -hmm. So maybe these explorers just didn't know what they're looking for. Maybe they were looking for a big sign that says, you know, Rhodes Mine or something like that on it. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't find anything. Now, when Caleb was out taking the, the things, the gold from the mine, he had a lot more trouble with people trying to follow him than Thomas did. So they were always trying to catch up with him and find out just where he was going for this. The worst one was his brother Enoch. Now this was, uh, Thomas Rhodes had a big family and he, one family stayed in California, one came here, but Caleb was the oldest that was here, and Enoch was the youngest. Well, Enoch was always trying to get Caleb to take him out and show him where the mines were. What happened? Well, Caleb, along with being able to get gold for the, from the Indians for the LDS church, he was a very successful miner. So he agreed to take Enoch out, and he showed him some mines out there where he, he was finding mine for the gold for his own personal benefit. Well, Enoch went out with him. They went out, found some gold. They were happy with it. Went back to town, and Enoch got thinking, you know, I want some of that for myself. So he went out on his own looking for the gold. And he spent several days looking. And right along, he saw what he thought was gold on the, on the ground. He got off his horse, cleaned the area out, discovered it was gold. He stood up, at just about the time he stood up, an arrow from an unknown location hit him in the chest. It was a fatal arrow, arrow and it took several days for him to die. Well... He got back on his horse and tried to get back to town. It was so far out that he had to stop and he made a dry camp. And he woke up during the night and he was really concerned. He had the feeling that he was completely surrounded by Indians. Well, he wanted somebody to know what happened to him. So he had an envelope but no pencil to write with. So he took the blood from his wound and a stick match and wrote on this envelope what happened. Then he put it back in his, his camp stuff. Well, the next morning when he woke up, he found that there was two families of Indians watching him. Well, the guys went down and shot him again. So now he's supposed to be dead. Well, they left. And the two women went down, the two squaws went down and found that he was alive and tried to nurse him back to health, but he didn't make it. So the word got to town and they went from town out and found his camp and found what had happened to him. So, you know, he just wouldn't follow the agreement with the Indians, so 
that's what happened to him. And another time when Caleb went out, the people knew he went out the afternoon, late afternoon, the evening. So a guy was really wise, and he started following Caleb. Caleb. He looked around, he looked around. Caleb left town, and this guy started following him. Well, Caleb went into some really dark, dense uh, forested area. And the guy's following him, couldn't find where he's going, and he got off his horse. And he went out, tied the horse up, he went out, scouting around for trace. <coughs> he didn't find any trace. So he went back to his horse. And he looked on his horse, right where he left it, but his prized possession, a pearl-handled pistol that he left on the horse, was gone. So he went back to town, and about a week later, Caleb saw him on the street and walked up and handed him the pistol and said, I found this up in the mountains. Did he? Did he take it off the horse? I don't know. So I thought that thing, that is a very interesting story about him. Okay, the third tale I like to tell about Caleb. Uh, like I say, he left in the evenings. A new people were watching him. So he went out, left, and a guy started following him from his horse beats. He went through a real hard, solid part of the ground. And you could hear the horse beats, the horse hoofs as it go on. Walk along, you'd hear these. So the guy's following him, staying back a ways, got dark. Horse, the B to go on, then the guy had followed him. Well, followed him all night long. Those horse hoof beasts were just leading him right to where Caleb was. The next morning, when he could finally see a little bit, he looks out, and there's an old Indian squaw and a horse going along. <laughs> so, once again, Caleb pulled the real quick one on him. Okay, when, Brick, when Brigham Young died about 20 years after they had been first getting the money rock, Chief Tabby had now taken over. And Tabby, and I have to make the assumption that Tabby is from the city of Taviona, is named after him. He was also a brother of Chief Arapine and Wakara. But Chief Tabby, he went to Brigham Young and he says, no more. You just can't take any more Indian gold. So they had to stop it at that point, and the the LDS Church agreed. Good time. We will stop it. But Caleb still, at this point, had not told anyone about how to find the the gold and anything about it like that. Now. There's a lot of rumors, there's a lot of stories, and a lot of things that people have told. And we'll look at some of the maps. But uh, Now, I'm not a great artist, and I copied this and enlarged it from the map that is in the books. I think these are quite interesting. This... It was labeled the map of a lost Rhodes mine. And Rock Creek, 1856, the old is at this location. Trail, a trail like this, trail fort, and a lake. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now this map was actually on a piece of buckskin that was about the size of a man's hand. Now, if I look at this, and I'm an engineer, have been, I say, okay, first of all, which way is north on there? Where do we start? How big of a lake is this? And this is a map to the Lost Rills Mine. This one is another Rhodes Spanish mine. 
Okay, now, that got us. I wouldn't know where to start. I wouldn't know where to finish. What no distances, anything about this. I can make the assumption from the other map that this is where the gold is. I don't know if that's right. I can assume these are ponds or lakes. I don't know anything about that. That's the kind of thing. This map was on a little larger piece of parchment. Now we get to the one that I like. Okay, this is Bald Mountain, it says. That's Bald Mountain. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the Brown Duck Lakes. I don't know anything about this. This area is a glacier. Now, we have to think 150 years ago, and with what global warming has done, you know, maybe there was a glacier at that point. There was a pond right here, I assume, and it says gold bars, and there's an X here. But boy, that's that's some pretty strange stuff. And where it says Bald Mountain, it says there's three rock graves and a mine. We've hiked uh, Bald Mountain here probably uh, an average of three or four times a year for the last 15 years. We've chased all over this area. I don't think I've ever seen a mine there. And it says we go two moon like this way. And that way's about right. I don't know. I've got another story I'll tell you about. Uh, about a lake and gold there. But we'll get that in just a few more minutes. Okay, Louise got a story of uh, the mine that she will repeat, repeat to you. Okay. Any of you heard of Matt Warner? Anybody know who Matt Warner was? He was associated with Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid. And we have a book about him. But many of the stories and the tales of the great American West are tied together. A lot of you have heard of Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and the Wild Bunch. One of their members from time to time was a bad guy named Matt Warner. Warner was also a freelance bandit and did many robberies and rustlings with others other than Cassidy and his clan. After Warner went straight, Caleb Rhodes had hired him to be a guard of some, some of his mining claims. In 1938, after Matt had died, his family was cleaning out his place and in the garage they found some coffee cans full of gold ore. When his, this ore was assayed, it was found to be the same quality of ore as the Rhodes family was getting from the Indian mines. Maybe Matt had figured out where the mine was, but he too never revealed the location. <coughs> That's pretty contemporary history, 1938. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got to be contemporary. That's the only year before Osborne. <laughs> <laughs> okay, about three years ago, I uh, took a class from the University of Utah. This one they set up for all us old, fo old folks to take. And it was taught by the head of the geology department at the University of Utah. Uh, he, it was really an interesting class on the geology of Utah. And uh, he is a very devout Mormon gentleman, very intelligent, really a great guy. After all of the classes were over and he was getting his stuff together one day, I caught him and I said, okay, doctor, what are the chances of there being gold in the Uinta Mountains like the Lost Roads Mine. Without even batting an eyeball, it's a hundred percent possible. And it is there. Okay, that's good. He says, in fact, Mr. Boren, who wrote this book Louise got in her hand, he is the one that took this Dr. Christensen to a location and he says, underneath that slide, and it was a mammoth rock slide, there is an entrance to one of the Lost Roads mine. Now this is a very well-educated person that I have an awful lot of respect for. Okay, and then I went to, and I've done this on several occasions, I've asked people about it, but this second person that I addressed, I will mention, was a former Forest Service employee. It's a guy I have great respect for his intelligence. And I asked him, 
I said, what are the chances of there being gold in the Uinta Mountains? He's absolutely zero on any stories <laughs> of the Lost Road Mine being up there are full, pure, unadulterated something something about <laughs> cattle, as I remember. So two people with great educations have 180 degree opposite opinions on them. Louise's got one. Okay, this chapter is entitled, Utah Has a Klondike. Where else do we hear of a Klondike? Alaska. In Alaska. Utah has a Klondike. Um, this is Caleb being quoted. Folks, I must confess that I'm one of those unfortunate beings that nature in bestowing her gifts overlooked. I can neither sing, dance, nor recite. However, and inasmuch as there has been so much speculation about the Rhodes Mine, I'll tell you facts concerning the same, hoping you'll let me off at that. Caleb's friends and neighbors were mystified by his sudden and unexpected remark concerning the old gold mine, and deep silence quickly filled the room. They sat back in their seats and gave him their undivided attention. Every eye seemed glued to him. Caleb glanced around the room through deep-set and penetrating eyes and then continued. One day, shortly after my father had returned from the goldfields of California, he met President Brigham Young on a street in Salt Lake City. Brother Rhodes, President Young began, you are the very man I've been looking for. I have a little mission for you. I want you to go into the Uinta Mountains to an old mine with the guide that Chief Walker is going to appoint and bring back as much gold ore as you can. On the appointed day, true to his promise, Chief Walker met President Young. With him, he brought several hundred warriors, all gaily attired, a gesture which bespoke the importance that the noted war chief regarded the occasion. This was in the beginning. Father made many trips, both to and from the mine, without incident. Then one summer, Father was ill and couldn't go. And for some time, Chief Arapine, who was then chief of the Utes, seemed to be mentally wrestling with the problem. Then his dark eyes snapped, as if the answer had come. Pointing to me, he asked, what about you, boy? To which President Young nodded approval. At that, Chief Arapine ordered my guide to come forward in the presence of all assembled. He gave final instructions to my new guardian. You go, you into, get plenty money rock, bring back to great white chief. He pointed to President Young. Then pointing to me, he added, if boy get hurt, lost, or no come back, and that he drew his hunting knife across his throat the meaning of which no one doubted. Of me, he requested that I hold up my right hand and vow before all present that I never would disclose the location of the mine to anyone as long as I lived. That oath I have never broken. We went and in due time returned with the oar. Thus, I fulfilled Father's mission. I've been back since, and as long as President Young was alive, the Indians proved friendly enough. But since, they have shown an ugly disposition. Going back into the Uintas has become very dangerous. Okay, now, very dangerous going to the Uinta Mountains. The final story I'm going to tell tonight is after Matt Warner. So we're looking at the 1940s, about the time when this allegedly has happened. Okay, there was a deer hunter out in the White Rocks area that was hunting. Deer hunt can be warm, warm days, hot even. Well, he left his canteen in his camp. And he was a little bit lost, but he did come across a riverbed, a stream. And he got down on his hands and knees, and I guess this was before the days we knew a GRE or beaver fever, and he took a drink. And as he looked down in the water, there was gold. Well, he sat up with great surprise, looking down, and as he looked up, there was, as he described it, a large Indian buck with a deer rifle pointed right at his chest. And the Indian signified, get up, leave everything where it is. No words were exchanged. This guy got up, left his stuff, and the Indian escorted him to the reservation boundary. 
As soon as they got to the boundary, the Indian was gone. So, I guess that's why we call it the Lost Rose Mine. The guy couldn't find anything when he went tried to go back. So, guys, gals, thank you for your time. We appreciate being able to talk to you. We hope you had some fun. Yeah, we have some gold coins for everybody. Come by and get some of these gold coins.